Anybody know what you call two monkeys that have a membership in Amazon? Primates? Okay, it, it'll get better. Martha, Martha liked that, and she's married to me, so. Last Sunday, we started a series from the Old Testament book of Job, and, and we determined that God is in control, even though it may not look like it at right this minute. And there are some in the middle of, of all the stuff that's happening in life that have reached the conclusion that if God is in control, that he mustn't care very much. Because how else do you explain the pain of this planet? From the little things like dead car batteries and shovel and snow to, to things like cancer. How do you explain when things do not go like we thought they should? You know, there is this religious belief called deism out there. And deism would tell you that God got the, the whole universe and the engines of the universe up and running, and that after that, he doesn't really intervene. The idea is God that God created the universe, but after that, he just sort of sits and watches. That he doesn't actually really intervene in the story or change anything. If we remember from last Sunday, Job, Old Testament Job, believes in God. And Job want to believe, wants to believe that God is in control and that God cares. But with losing everything, he sees evidence that God may be out of control and not real caring. Remember last Sunday that Job lost all of his livestock, he lost all of his business, he lost all of his teams of oxen to plow. Job also lost all of his servants except the couple that came to tell him of the disaster. He lost all of his children. I, I can't imagine that. And what we want to look at next is God gives Satan permission to turn all of this loss and add to it a tax on Job's health. Here's Job 2 verses 1 to 7. On another day, the angels came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came with them to present himself before him. And the Lord said to Satan, where have you come from? Satan answered the Lord from roaming throughout the earth, going back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job? Same as in chapter one. There's no one on earth like him. He is blameless and upright, a man who fears me and shuns evil. And he still maintains his integrity, though you incited me against him to ruin him without reason. He still maintains his integrity. Here Satan, just like the first time in Job chapter 1, is challenging the truthfulness of God's word and the motives of Job's character. He's basically saying, you know, the only reason that Job was worshiping God was because God gave Job stuff. He had all this stuff. What else did he need? Here Satan has a new argument, and it starts in verse 4. He says, God, skin for skin, Satan replied. A man will give all he has for his own life. But now stretch out your hand and strike his flesh and bones, and he will surely curse you to your face. Affect his health, and he will curse you to your, to your face. Those other things, that was just stuff. Affect his body and life, and he'll curse you. Now understand, skin for skin was a proverbial saying that had to do with trading animal skins. Satan was insinuating that Job would trade the loss of his animals, the loss of his servants, even the loss of his children, for his own life. Verse 6, the Lord said to Satan, very well then, he is in your hands, but you must spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and afflicted Job with painful sores. The translation of that really means literally boils, festering boils. And this was from the soles of his feet to the crown of his head. Inflamed, ulcerous sores. As we read through Job, here are some of the other things he suffered. 
We just said ulcerous sores, itching, degenerative changes to the skin, loss of appetite, depression, loss of strength. This one just grabs me. Worms in the boils. Not just festering boils, but worms in the boils. Difficulty breathing, weight loss, foul breath, blackened skin, and fever. <laughs> wow. Here's verses 8 to 10. Then Job took a piece of broken pottery and scraped himself with it as he sat among the ashes. He was scraping his sores with a hunk of pottery. Now the place he sat among the ashes was outside where everybody lived. It's actually where they burned their trash. So he's sitting on a trash heap trying to clean up these wounds. Here's a guy of Job's, self, Job's esteem sitting out on an ash pile away from all the other people. Verse 9, his wife said to him, are you still maintaining your integrity? Curse God and die. He replied, you are talking like a foolish woman. And these words actually indicate that she was talking about things with, that she was spiritually ignorant or spiritually non-discerning. He wasn't saying you're stupid. He's saying you're not discerning in spiritual matters. Shall we accept good from God and not trouble? In all this, Job did not sin in what he said. Mrs. Job sees enough pain and suffering and, and she's basically done with God. And she wants Job to be done with God too. Last week we touched on some questions from God to Job that indicated God's power and strength. He's strong, he's in control. Different angle this week, but is he tender? Is he kind, does he care? You know, one of the most common descriptions of God in scripture is as a father. But what kind of father is he? When my son Christian was little, he would come into our room at night when he needed something. But here's what I figured out. What he needed determined which side of the bed he went. Yeah, I'm sure you're like this as well. If you're married, you probably have your own side of the bed and so shall it forever be, right? It's just the way it is. How many of us have their own side of the bed? Yeah, yeah. If any of you doubt that, go on the other side tonight and see what happens. Lay down on the other side. First, you'll feel creepy, but then when your spouse comes in, you're gonna get the one up of, absolutely. Hey, this isn't your side of the bed. <laughs> Christian as a kid knew which side of the bed we slept and depending on what he needed that's the side of the bed he went if he was scared and wanted protection he came to my side of the bed if he didn't feel good and needed comfort he went to Martha's side of the bed my side protection Martha's side comfort if ever he wasn't sure and Martha's going to disagree with that but if, if ever he wasn't sure, he came to me by default because mom was impossible to wake up. <laughs> and I was the guy that kind of slept with one eye open. I heard all the sounds and ugh. Now, if there was ever throw up involved, then I helped him wake up Martha. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, you know what I mean? <laughs> that, that's right. <laughs> so we understand God's power and his strength. But it seems like Job walked around to the other side of the bed to find out that God really cared. Are you tender? Are you kind? And in Job chapters 38, 39, and 40, God is asking Job questions. He starts off with these grand questions. We talked about some of them last week. Uh, about the universe. Where were you when I laid the foundations of the earth, Job? Job, do you know how many snowflakes are going to fall to the ground? Job, do you know how to move the constellations around in the sky? <clears throat> is that you who did that? And what becomes clear is that God is in control and we would not be alive unless he is. 
But then the focus of God's questions go from astronomy to biology. John, you'll like these questions. He goes from questions about the expanse of the universe to talking about caring for nature. In Job 38, verse 39 to 41, God asked Job, do you hunt the prey for the lioness and satisfy the hunger of the lions when they crouch in their den or lie in wait in the thickets? Do you do that, Job? Birds, who provides food for the raven when it's young? when it cries out to God and wonders about for lack of food. Here's Job 39 verses one and two. Do you know when the mountain goat gives birth? Do you watch when the doe bears her fawn? Do you count the mouths till they bear, the months till they bear? Do you know the time that they give birth? Feel free to answer any of those questions, Job. And we start to see a picture of a God that is much more tender Job 39, 5 to 8. Job, who let the wild donkey go free? Who untied its ropes? I gave it the wasteland as its home and salt flats as its habitat. It laughs at the commotion in town. It does not hear a driver's shout. It, ra it ranges the hills for its pasture and searches for every green thing. Here's Job 39, 9 to 12. Will the wild oxen consent to serve you? Will they stay by your manger at night? Can you hold it to the furrow with a harness? Will it till the valleys behind you? Will you rely on it for its great strength? Will you leave your heavy work to it? Can you trust it to haul your grain and bring, in your, bring, in, bring it into your threshing floor? Just some simple questions, Job. For those of you who watched the movie Secretariat, it's about the horse Secretariat. Movie starts with these lines. Anybody see that movie? Oh, watch it. It's one of my favorite movies of all time, Secretariat. And I'm not a horse racing guy, but this is beautiful. Job 39, Secretariat starts with this. Job 39, 19, I'll read through 24 because I love the movie. It starts out by saying, verse 19, do you give the horse its strength or clothe it its neck with a flowing mane? Did you make it leap like a locust, striking terror with its proud snorting? It paws fiercely, rejoicing in its strength and charges into the fray. It laughs at fear, afraid of nothing. It does not shy away from the sword. The quiver rattles against its side, along with the flashing spear and lance. It's frenzied ex in frenzied excitement, it eats up the ground. It cannot stand still when the trumpet sounds. You just listen to that and you like horses a lot more. He jumps back to birds. Back to birds, Job. Job 39, 26 to 29. Does the hawk take flight by your wisdom and spread its wings towards the south? Does the eagle soar at your command and build its nest on high? It dwells on cliffs and stays there at night. A rocky crag is its stronghold. From there it looks for food. Its eyes detect from afar. And God is plotting out these different animals and pointing them out to Job and how he protects and provides and cares about all of them. And Job realizes that God is not just a cosmic controller. He's a caring creator who delights in his creation. A God who is thoughtful, a God is, who is thoughtful in his provisions. Do you know that an eagle has eyesight that is four times sharper than ours? An eagle has what is called dual focus vision. It allows the eagle to see what's in front of it and what is beside it at the same time. It's not like our peripheral vision. This is dual focus vision. See the front and see the side all at the same time. There's a passage in Job chapter 12, verses seven to 10, where Job says that one of the ways we understand God is by talking to the animals. 
Now it sounds like, like it's a bit crazy, but listen to the poetry here. But ask the animals and they will teach you, or the birds in the sky and they will tell you. Or speak to the earth and it will teach you, or let the fish of the sea inform you. Which of all these does not know that the hand of the Lord has done this? In his hand is the life of every creature and the breath of all mankind. God is sovereign and he holds all things in his hand. Just look at the animals and how God takes care of them. Listen to their story and you see a sovereign God. You can't look at the beauty of creation and not be amazed. So let's do that. Let's understand, for example, just the woodpecker. We've all seen, everybody's seen woodpeckers, right? Anybody ever see the big pileated one? The Woody the Woodpecker type? Oh, are they cool. A woodpecker's head goes greater than 15 times a second. Its head literally is moving at twice the speed of a bullet. And theoretically, the speed and that pounding should kill it. But God has given it some type of shock absorber between the beak and the brain to protect it from harm, to allow it to search for food, to build its nests in trees that it's hollowed out. Biologists and engineers have not been able to come up with anything that matches that thing that's between the beak and the, and the brain of the woodpecker. You wanna to talk to animals? Ask the honeybees. Honeybees go out and search for plant nectar and when they have it, they become the greatest pollinators of plants. We could not survive without bees. But the bees return to the nest with their nectar and then they tell the other bees where they found it. But how do they do that? It took scientists a long time to figure it out. They don't say, well, Joe, you know, you leave the nest and you go about 500 yards and you take a left at the hickory tree, not a hard left, a short left, and, and then you go about a half mile and that's where those plants are. What they do is an intricate dance to tell the other bees where to find flower nectar. They do a dance for crying out loud. I've asked Martha to start doing a dance to show me where I left my car keys. <laughs> Are you kidding me? God is making sure his creation is cared for or you can just simply ask a pigeon. Pigeons can fly thousands of miles to the same roosting place without any navigational challenges at all. There's a species of birds called the Arctic Tern. Check this out. It can fly 25,000 miles from one destination to another and it never gets lost. It doesn't have any navigational problems at all. Scientists believe that they have a magnetic system that allows them to understand direction. Sort of like a GPS system that works on magnetism. Job will tell you, ask the birds about a sovereign God. And that's basically what we talk about in chapter 39. You know, you can tell a lot about the artist by the art. You can tell a lot about a creator by his creation. And so the creation speaks of the power and strength of God, but it also invites you and me to the other side of the bed so you can discover a God that's thoughtful and tender and cares. Now remember, God doesn't answer Job's specific questions, and maybe that's what we really want. We want to put God on a stand and interrogate him. We want to ask him questions and demand explanations. But I need to tell you the reality of it God doesn't owe Job or you or me an explanation. He is God. Instead, here he asks a series of questions to make it known to Job that he knows and sees and cares. <coughs> and the questions are the same out to us as well. And even though you don't have answers to all your questions, do you believe he cares? Imagine you're a parent and you take your three-year-old daughter to the doctor for shots. 
never fun. Where she's going to get poked by needles and experience pain, and the little girl cries and asks why. And you can give her the statistics. Honey, you need to get these shots to prevent this or that illness. You need these shots to help you recover from illness that you have. But she doesn't get it because she's three. She's not capable of understanding. All she knows is you took her to a place where she got poked with needles and she's supposed to believe that you care about her. How do you explain that? Well, here's a way. I think you take your little daughter over to the hall closet and you open it up and you show her blankets. And you ask, why are the blankets there? Well, for when I'm cold. And you take her over to the pantry and you open it up and you show her food. Why is that there? Well, for when I'm hungry. Do you see the hall cabinet? Do you see the pantry and the refrigerator? And all around you is evidence that you are cared for by us. That's what God does for Job. And Job sees God's provision in ways he never understood before. And part of that is because when we first meet Job, he didn't really need it. He had everything he needed. Nothing pressing, no desperate needs. He was a wealthy man, and suddenly it's all stripped away. Job, verse four, Job chapter 42, verse 5. Remember Job says this of God. My ears have heard you, but now my eyes have seen you. And when Job sees his need for God, he sees God. When all the stuff gets stripped away, he sees God like he's never seen him before. Let me tell you about one more bird. It's called the golden plover. It's about the size of a finch, about two inches. Every year, the golden plover makes a 2,500-mile journey from Alaska to Hawaii nonstop. Estimates are that it beats his wings 300,000 times consecutively without stop. When scientists look at this flight, it's not technically possible. It can't possibly do that nonstop. Technically, it would crash at the max 81% into the trip. It should technically crash into the sea no further than 81% of the route. But I think maybe that's when you think of God and you think of the God of the golden plover. Because some are tired. A lot of beating of our wings. Maybe not sure you're going to make it. Too far, too long. Not even sure how long this is going to last. And at 81% of your trip, you can't go on. But this is where you meet God. And when you're tired and weak and can't go any further, that's where you meet God in a way that you've never heard or seen him before. Maybe you've heard about him. Now you can see him. There's something about seeing our need that allows us to see God. God teaches us to pray. Give us this day our daily bread. But honestly, when was the last time we prayed that? It's easier to run to boyers. They got lots of bread. God says, don't be anxious about anything, but make your request known to me. Beautiful invitation, God, but I've got this new prescription from the doctor, and so I'm good now. God says, I'll meet all of your needs. Good, great to know that, God, but I've got a lot of job security. And my insurance is good, and I have some retirement money set aside. God says, come to me, all you who are weary, and I will give you rest. Rest, do you mean like a day at the spa? Do you mean time on the golf course? Because that's really what I miss. That's what I could use in my life right now. See, what we have done is we've surrounded ourselves with all this stuff, all these supports, and we miss the opportunity to see God. Because God goes from being nice to being necessary 
when we recognize our need for him. I've seen it, I've been in mansions, I've been in the ghetto. And I can tell you where you're most likely to see God. Because I've seen him, seen him at graveside services, I've seen him in cancer wards in the children's hospital, I've seen him in waiting rooms and food kitchens. I've seen him kneeling down beside a bed of someone who's in prayer who desperately needs him. David said this in Psalm 34, 18, that the Lord is close to the brokenhearted and save those who are crushed in spirit. And in 1 Peter 5, 7, we hear this familiar phrase, cast all your anxiety on him because, well, because he cares for you. So the question is, is do you believe that? Do you believe God is not only the cosmic controller, but he's also the caring creator? If you don't believe it, let me ask you to take some time to read Job chapter 39. The stuff we talked about today. Or you can maybe just talk to the woodpecker or the honeybee or the pigeon or the golden plover. Because they will tell you of a sovereign God and a tender one. I am going to end this the same way I ended the message last week. But the greatest evidence of a loving, caring God is sending Jesus here as a baby and then to a cross. I'd like you to personalize this. I'd like you to say this. Jesus died for me. Jesus died for me. For me. How great a love, how great a God. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the truth of your word. Thank you as you show us through Job just who you are. Not only that you are completely in control, that you completely love and care. My God, we pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen.